All right, how's it going? My name is Joey Caroga. I am from Tucson, Arizona. I'm a huge Arizona Wildcats fan. I uh, did 22 years in the United States Air Force as a logistician and trying to break into the sports industry as we speak uh, and uh, here to talk about sports. All right. Well, on the Ultimate Sports Network, that is what we do. So you've come to the right place. Um, now, we're going to talk about a few different things. We're going to kind of keep it football oriented today. Um, let me give you a, 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 an idea for those of you listening, where my, my mindset is right now for this interview. Uh, we've had a chance to talk off the air. Good guy. Uh, excited about what we're talking about. So we're going to bounce off the walls a little bit. So if it gets a little too intense for you, sorry about that. Okay. Now, we were talking, let's, let's start with uh, college football to get started. Because we saw something happen. You mentioned Arizona alum. We saw something happen in the Pac-12. Uh, I'm going to call them the Pac-8 again, the Pac-12 this weekend uh, with Arizona, Arizona State. And we're talking about this weekend coming up with all the rivalry games. Is that as big of a rivalry as we think it is because it's in-state? You're talking about the Arizona, right? Right. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, these teams are traditionally not that great in the Pac-12. Uh, so sometimes that, that game is like all that's going on inside that state for some uh, – for every, every couple of years. Uh, so Herm Edwards coming in there and turning that program around has been very positive for the team up north. But for Arizona, like huge monster setback after letting go Rich Rod due to some personal and internal issues, uh, that, that stunk because he was really, we were going to bowl games every year with him. Right. Yeah, it was eight and five, seven and, and seven and five. But like we also won the Pac-12 South one year um, and 14, I believe. And so uh, he had us on a good path, but back to the rivalry, like, absolutely, man. This game's huge in uh, basketball. Uh, usually Arizona State isn't as good, but, like, it's still due to the rivalry. They, they come around and play. And also in baseball, too, huge, a lot of, oh, tradition, yeah. a lot of tradition in the baseball side. So uh, those games are brutal. Tons of draft picks, uh, you know, big-time players on those teams. So in those three major sports – uh, the rivalry is huge. And then obviously let's talk about the territorial cup, the oldest uh, trophy. Uh, yeah. Rivalry trophy in college football, 1899. Well, and for people who don't know about some of the people that have come out of both schools. Now we're usually familiar with the, the Sean Elliott's and, and the Steve Kerr's that have come out of Arizona, but you can go back to Arizona state talking about baseball to Reg Jackson, you yeah. know, Barry Bond. So Barry Bond. There, yeah. there, there have been some, and that's just the top of the, of the heap there. Uh, I remember watching Eddie House put up 60-something one game, yep. you know, and he went, what in the heck? ESPN 12 at, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning. And he went, what in the world? He, the guys couldn't miss, you know. So, and that's the the fat lever, Byron Scott, uh, those kind of guys. Uh, Kurt Nymphius, you know, going back away. So, yep. you know, so we're looking at talented players that have been coming out of both programs. And in the football way, other you go back to Desert Swarm, you know, you go back to some – really good players and really good programs that have come up, just maybe not upper, upper echelon. But now we get to a game where, you know, like you said, Herm Edwards has got them going and Kevin Sumlin may be on the hot seat. And what's your take on the game that, that transpired after that? Well, yeah. So I knew, I, I knew this game, this game was going to be make or break for him. Uh, uh, so to speak, just the, the seat was getting hot, but also, uh, I think it, it, it. I think there was going to be, if that would have been uh, a competitive game, I don't think that he would have gotten fired. Right. Uh, I think if we would have showed some fire, because like there's some talent there. There are some talented kids. We have good quarterbacks. We got good receivers. We have a really good stable of running backs too. The defense we got crushed with transfers this year. Uh, there's two guys starting for West Virginia right now. Right. There's right. The, the the schooler. We had the schooler brothers. Uh, one transferred from Oregon to Arizona and then transferred with his brother over to Texas, uh, Texas tech. So like those guys were all four starters on the defense. Right. And so we got killed there. So we knew the defense wasn't going to be that great this year. I didn't think we were going to go Oh, and five. Uh, and I don't think that's what sealed this fate straight up. I think the 70 to seven and just no life out there, no life from the sidelines, no life from the players. Um, I just think, I think that's what sealed his fate. And whoever comes in there and uh, takes over, there's there's going to be some talent in the cabinet. There's going to be some talent on that roster, but there's going to be a huge, huge uh, family uh, culture that needs to be instilled. 
and hey, we can do this type thing. You're good enough. You're not 70 to seven type players. Right. That's going to be the transition, the switch that needs to happen there. And uh, I think the only guy that I only think the only I think one of the main players that should in the game to come and do it or in the in the coaching pool would be a former Arizona player uh, for, or former Arizona coach. Uh, I think that's going to be the only one that like truly brings the bear down mentality and then just like straight up writes the ship. Cause I don't think it's that bad. We drop, let's, let's rewind a little bit. Dropped red zone interception against USC or we win that game. Right. Right. Uh, up, up two touchdowns on ranked Colorado and the defense just fell apart. Right. They ran all over our defense, but we were up 13, nothing at halftime uh, or something like that in the first half. Right. So uh, there's something there. And then UCLA, we played them tough. They ended up, they ended up winning by about 11, two touches, mm-hmm. two scores. But, like, that game was close. And it's not the talent gap. It's the coaching. It's the philosophy. It's the strategy. And then it's the, it, uh, the, the scale tip is just that defense is just – there's just walk – there's four walk-on starting. Well, uh, it, it, and that's what made it so amazing or unbelievable that that game played the way it did because – they beat UC, or USC, I'm sorry. Yeah. They beat USC. Yeah, and, and we'll get into that later. But, you know, that was the first game I went, okay, either USC isn't that bad, that good, which I still don't believe they are, or Arizona's not a bad team. You know, because they, they dominated that game, in my opinion. So you get to the point where you go, okay, it w- was that the tipping point or the, the start of it? Like, we should have won that game, and now we're going to play five or six games and – and maybe that's where leadership, coaching, and whatnot, they could have bounced back from that, as we were talking about off there. Some of that bounce back to it is sure. what you need. If they didn't have that, well, then we see the disintegration as the season progresses. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, like I said, I don't, I don't, I think he, I think Kevin Sumlin was going to get away with it this year. I think he was going to mm-hmm. get one more year. Uh, but uh, overall, like, I thought that was a home run hire. Like, you know, here at mid-tier Arizona, I'll take anybody from the SEC or with any clout, right? We took right. John Makovich, that blew up in our face. Uh, we took Rich Rod, that was a positive. We take Sumlin, and I thought, you know, the years at Houston and the years at Texas A&M, we were going to get four to five stars every year. Right. You know, maybe not 20 of them, but like 10 to 15 trans, uh, transitional players and going to turn that, our program up a notch. And it just didn't happen. And so, like, year one, four and eight. Uh, last year, uh, another, four, uh, I think, yeah, five and seven in the year, first year, sorry, uh, four and eight last year. And then, like, you're just seeing the, 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 the regress, though. You're seeing not only the talent regress, but you're seeing, like, the coaching regress. Like, the play calling is just so vanilla. Right. I mean, I'm nobody. And I am picking, I know exactly what these what guys are going right. to do. Right. right. I know exactly what they're going to do. And I'm like, man, imagine what a defensive coordinator is doing. And so that's just kind of what we're looking at. That's what we're seeing. And uh, I'm glad that they pulled the trigger. Like uh, I, I would have given them a one more year uh, if the game was spirited against ASU and it was close. And if we even won. Right. If, if we would have won. Cool. Right. I think it would have got him one more year. But like just to go out like that, I think the eventually the writing was on the wall and it was ch- time to just rip that Band-Aid off. And get somebody else in here ASAP. Well, you could, you know, if you went, you know, if it was 27-24 or or 27-21 or something like that, yeah. it was a close game. You could go back to the USC game and go and the Colorado game and say, hey, we're just a play here or play there away from being, you know, over 500. Yeah. And it, and let it let's let him build. But like you said, you know, you lose those games that you probably should have won, and then you're not even close to being competitive in that one. So now, as that plays into the entire Pac-12, what do you think of the Pac-12 this year? Because I know it's been an up and down, really topsy-turvy year for everybody. But as we look at the Pac-12 and, and how this plays out this weekend, and actually USC beating UCLA, that might have helped or hurt. I'm not really sure about that. How do we see the Pac-12 moving forward, bowl season, and maybe even possibly uh, in the playoffs? Yeah, so I'm I'm a big Pac-12 fan, right? I'm a, I'm a big uh, advocate for them, but I'm also a very hard on them with the, with the critics. And so I think they really missed out a huge. I think the Pac-12, Larry Scott, uh, commissioner, missed out a huge opportunity to get Colorado to play that championship game 
with USC. Yeah. Uh, to, to take a three and two Oregon team uh, after uh, Washington couldn't get in there, I think that's trash. I think, uh, I mean, everybody was looking forward to this USC Colorado. They're the only two ranked teams in the conference. Right. right. Like, right. let those guys play together. Like, the Big 12 is already making changes on their little wavering, their little system. We should be doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And they were going to play next week. Right. Uh, I think, yeah, the game was coming up in a couple of days. Like, uh, so turn that into the Pac-12 championship game and see what both teams are worth. Now, Colorado goes and throw, lays an egg against Utah, uh, but they only have one loss. And USC and, and Oregon has is two. So, like, they're out. So right. get, get Colorado in there. Uh, I think they still have a number next to their name. I think they're still ranked even after that Utah loss. Uh, but Colorado USC should be the Pac-12 championship game. Now, it's over to USC, man, like these dudes, I mean, the stars are aligned for these cats because they should have lost to ASU first week. They should have lost to us. And they sure as heck should have lost to UCLA last week. So these dudes are like sucking on a ding. They're, they've got everything going their way right now. And it's not fair. I, I, I've said to one of my friends, this is the maybe the worst undefeated team I've ever seen in the history of sport. And I, and I'm not, I mean, I'm a closet USC fan from back in the day, you know, but they're, it just kind of, Oh, well here, you, I know we beat you, but we know we beat you. You know, we beat you. We got, you've got the name here. Take the win. Yeah. That's what it felt like. I mean, it really did. I mean, it's like the UCLA game. How in the heck did they win that game? Or more accurately, how did UCLA lose it? Absolutely. I guess is the, the way to put it. I, I'm I'm stunned, you know. And when I heard on one of the the talking heads this morning saying, "Well, it's possible USC gets into like, have you watched them play?" No. You know, well, there's, there's also not anybody ahead of them. Like they haven't beat anybody ranked this year. No. Like they they they've ate they've eaten on the bottom feeders of the Pac-12, right? Like I said, and they should be two and three. They should right. be two right. and three easily. Right. But they're not. They're not. So, like, let's scratch that. They're not. They're 5-0. and oh. and uh, But also, you know, like, this is Blue Blood program. This is how right. it's always going to be. Like, you don't just beat you, uh, USC even in their down years. Like, right. you've got to take it to them. And you have to have that roster that has more talent than theirs. Because they're always, just like Alabama and just like Michigan, just like Ohio State and Florida and Florida State. Even Florida State could go 0-12. There's still five stars on that team. Right. Miami, and, like and several and of them, yeah. and they're going to get more the next year. Right. Whether they're zero and ten, zero and twelve, doesn't matter. Same with the U, right? So USC is our West Coast version of that. Like no matter who, how good you are, ten and zero, Oregon, number one, number two, number three in the in the in the in the nation, still has to go into the Coliseum right. and beat them every year with five stars versus five stars. So uh, I think something that's and USC back is, is a big name coach like uh, Clay Helton is I, I guess he's I mean I, I can't I can't poo poo on him but like uh, he's he's done a good job but like who wouldn't with five stars all day uh, so I think if they had a big name coach in there like that would turn into a juggernaut again because like you know Pete Carroll went in there and all he did was be friends with them all you know right. what I mean? like he was just he is what he is in the NFL he did the right. same thing USC let these guys be themselves Reggie Bush Matt Liner uh you know Lindale why you let those guys just be themselves and it it really blossomed on the field for them and so you're always going to have five stars in there no matter what happens and so that's the difference that's the difference of playing uh Arizona and Arizona State at the wire that like eventually the talent gap is going to take over and you have what you have well, and I think at USC, what happens is, is the coach, because it's the, the, the rock star attitude and atmosphere, and even if you go back to John McKay and, and then John Robinson after that, like you said, let them play. Yeah. And you've got to be able to feed into that. You've got to be a media guy. You have to be able to be a part of that Southern California experience. Yeah. And Clay Helton, ask Clay Helton if he's been to the beach. You know, yeah. I mean, it just doesn't seem like, and again, you're still like, you're still getting those guys, but they just don't seem to be able to go out there with that swagger that used to seeing USC have, you know, the, the Ronnie Lots and, and I know I'm going way back, but this, 
I'm coming across the field and I'm going to smack you in the face and there's nothing you can do about it. Or yeah. like you said, the Reggie Bush, I, you can't, you can't touch me. I'm the best player here every game. I'm the best athlete out there every game. And though you may have those guys, they're still not look like looking like they're allowed to be those guys right now. Yeah, and just like let's just let's just talk about it real quick. The last couple of years, look at who are the big name wide receivers or who are who's making a splash uh, in the NFL. Those guys were on really bad USC football teams, right? right. My, Michael Pittman with the Colts, like he is a monster. He's a like he's. I don't think he's not really developed all the way there yet, but like he's, he's going to get there. Yeah. He's six, four, you know what I mean? Six, three, six, four. He's a big frame. You got Juju Smith Schuster. Um, and then you, you've got uh, uh, the running back from the uh, uh, Tampa Bay, Ronald Jones, Ronald yeah. Jones, the Rojo, third. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then uh, look at, look at JT Dan Jan Daniels right, over in right. Georgia, tearing it up, new system, new coach, mm -hmm. new environment, tearing it up. So yeah, man, those are, those are, when you go to USC, you're going to be a pro. That is the Alabama of the West Coast. You know what right. I mean? So so every time my little Arizona team has to play those guys, uh, I just hope for the best, and I hope that we can uh, sneak up on them and take care of them uh, like we did, almost did this year. Uh, but I know at the end of the day that, like, I'm out there playing against dudes that are going to be on a 53-man roster next year. So. Right, right. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. Not to make the segue yet. I'm the king of the segue if you didn't know that. <laughs> uh, but uh, watching last night's game with the Browns and, and the Ravens, you know, they show the, the Ravens uh, offensive players went seven of these 11 guys went to either Alabama or Oklahoma. Oh yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. You know, so, so we understand what the blue bloods do. Okay. Now looking at the whole, let, let's look at the picture of, since we talked about Kevin someone, let's look at the picture of guys that, well, for lack of a better way of putting it, ain't going to be coaching next year or at least won't be coaching for their particular teams. Um, looking at the coaching carousel, let's, let's start with Arizona. Would, are you looking for someone like, and I'm just throwing the name out there, I'm not even sure that it even is an idea, but like uh, you said, an Arizona alum, would you go out and like try and get a, a Teddy Bruschi or at least someone that could go get people to be a part of things? So he may be the GM of things, but you need that enthusiasm. You need that guy who is an alum. You need the guy that's got that experience of championship experience. And then he can bring an OC and a head coach in, or a DC in there and, and make things work. Yeah, not necessarily him, but someone like that. So there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of names out there and they're not big name names, right? There's nothing that's going to knock your socks off. Uh, but there's a lot of ex Tommy guys, Dick Tommy, right? Former Arizona coach. And a lot of his players are now coaches because that's what kind of guy he was. Right. That's what kind of coach he was. So just a quick uh, lineup of names that are out there coaching that are former Arizona alum. You've got Joe Salavea, Desert Storm. Uh, Antonio Pierce, who is with oh, the Sun yeah. Devils. He's with the mm -hmm. Sun Devils, though, so he's probably not leaving. Yeah. And caveat, his son is on the Sun Devil team right now. I think he's a, a cornerback, defensive yeah. back. Um, you got David Phipp, who it was a safety for us in the Desert Storm years. He's a he's the Titan special teams coordinator. Okay, I think uh, I can't remember exactly what team. Uh, Chuck Cecil. Chuck oh, okay. Chuck Cecil is a defensive analyst, but uh, he finished the last four years last year as our defensive coordinator after we fired Mar uh, Marcel Yates. Okay, so he's still around and he breathes Arizona oh, football. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and you're going to have toughness with him. That's your darn sure. So what, with all that being said, and okay, so since you mentioned Brewski, uh, I think Teddy, who is my boy and my favorite Wildcat of all time, probably, uh, I think he's happy where he's at, I'll tell you right now. With no prior head coaching, uh, sure, you know, sure. like I'm sure he knows what it takes uh, as a former player. He knows what those coaches went through during his years. And then as an NFL player, he knows what it's like. Um I think that the time that he wants to give it, not saying that he wouldn't give it. I just think when he looks at his life every day and his happiness, sure. I, uh, uh, I think, I mean, cause we would love to have him. The only knock against him would be, he doesn't have any coaching experience, right. but like the town would be a buzz. If any of those five, four to five guys were hired, okay. especially Joe Salavea, because he's actually coaching. He's the defensive line coach at Oregon. Uh, or Oregon State. God, sorry, I can't remember. That's right. Uh, but each one of these guys is like they're coaching everywhere except for Teddy. So 
Uh, Lance Briggs has been a name that's came up. Okay. Too. I, think, I think he's coaching the high school. So he could come and be at least a coordinator. Sure. Uh, maybe not, I know, HC, but you could come yep. in. So yeah, that's, that's, yeah, if you bring him as your linebacker coach, I have no problem with that at all. Yeah, I think those would be the big splash, big fan hype. Uh, but the athletic director, man, he, he, this is a tough, this is going to be a tough gig. This is going to be a tough sell uh, with the recent, I mean, we're on a 12 game losing streak. Yeah. Uh, so it's got to be, it doesn't have to be a home run, but it's got to be extra bases. You know, it's got to be in the gap right. for a double. And so a couple names, just since we're talking about it, uh, I, you know, the guy from San Jose State is a big, uh, it's been a name that's been coming up a lot uh, in the Southern Arizona forums, the newspapers, uh, the fan sites. Uh, but this is his first winning season at San Diego right. State, but obviously, I mean, San Jose, but that's a tough gig too. Right. Um, Always has been, right? Yeah. Another thing with us is going to be money. We're paying Rich Rod and we're paying someone right now. So this is going to be three coaches on the books, whoever we bring in. And so you're paying I, Sean Miller too. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, I think that's, I think it's going to be, it's not a good, it's, I think that's why it's going to be a non-splash. I think it's going to be either somebody with direct ties to the school that will coach for less um, because I think everybody else that's like looking for a promotion to power five is going to command money. And right. like, there's been some Gus Malzahn talk. Yeah, right, dude. He's not coming from SEC land and we're not paying him 20 mil a year. That's for right. sure. Um, I think the guy that I would love to have, but the, I actually two guys, I just don't think they'll make the move because of their recent success. And that's Kalani Sataki from BYU and then Brian Harson from Boise. I would love to have those guys. And I think they would be close to home run hires we can get. I just don't think they would, they saw the scoreboards. And yeah. Right. Right. I, I, they know, they know some of those coaches, I'm sure. Right. We have a lot of Boise state ex coaches on our, uh, like uh, some of the coordinators and just positional coaches. Um, a couple of texts and a phone call there uh, would be like, ah, dude, get away from this thing, you know? So yeah, I, I think it's got to lean towards somebody connected to the school or if you can lure, I, I mean, uh uh, Brad, is it Brad Brennan, Brent Brennan? Uh, I, I wouldn't be too mad about that. The guy from San Jose state, but, right. but, uh, I just think, I don't think that's going to, the AD, I don't think Dave Heek's going to dig on that. I think it's Harson, um, or an Arizona, a former Arizona coach somewhere in, in, the in the landscape of NCAA. Well, you, you've got a couple of guys or actually three or four guys because we've had a spotlight on the Sun Belt this year. So those are some guys that might get some play, whether they're ready or not. Again, being able to judge the actuality of this season is so tough. Yeah. But between, you know, Coastal Carolina, you know, between uh, a lot of those guys in Louisiana, you know, you, they had some seasons where that's some fun ball they're playing there. Yeah, for sure. You know, so you never know, but that's kind of, you know, where things are messed up now. Okay. Now you mentioned a couple things there that I've thought about, and we've been talking about on other shows. And I know that this is kind of up in the air. We're talking because of all this is happening right now. What about expansion in the PAC 12? Yeah. Good. Uh, good, good uh, toss out right there. I like that. Um, so I get lucky yeah. every now and then. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of talks uh, with that expansion and then who would be the right fit. Uh, so going right off the top of my head, obviously here in Las Vegas, um, I think UNLV would be uh, a prime candidate, uh, not because of their play on the court or the field. Uh, that hasn't been going very well, but I just think their facilities and I think right. the geographical regional uh, uh, would be a great fit, especially the Pac-12 uh, championship games already here at Allegiant right. Stadium. So I think their facilities, their pro style facilities in both basketball, football, and even baseball, like that's a good facility. Right. The that's baseball true. field yeah. is not bad. Right. Uh, so, and, and, and that's, that's what the PAC 12 is going to feed off of. Those are our strength. Uh, those are our strength uh, sports, so to speak. And so I think uh, as a West coast. So I think that's where they're going to look into uh, also like there's a, a handful, there's an, uh, there is a handful of those mountain West teams that are very eligible uh BYU is an independent so I don't I think know. yeah I think they'll I think they'll stick with the I, I think they like being ranked I think they like playing whoever they want to play especially right. 
you know, I wish they would have played a little better against Coastal, but I think Coastal is a beast that's that's getting yeah. awakened. Yeah. Getting awakened. But uh, yeah, so I would go with San Diego State as well. Um, have, uh, have you seen the plans for their new facility, their new yeah. uh, football oh, stadium? Yeah. yeah. That's going to be really nice. Uh, and their basketball arena is already top of the line, Viejas Arena. So San Diego State would be huge geographically as well. Now, does Larry Scott say, oh, is that too much California for the pack? Maybe. Um, but I think uh, adding somebody like, and Boise is always in the conversation, right? Uh, I think Boise's problem is they're not very competitive in the other sports. So right. uh, basketball, they would just get drug. Um, and, and to see San Diego State would be able to handle uh, a basketball. And then I think right. that would really elevate the Pac-12 conference in basketball. Right. I think it would really elevate uh, their stature. So because we've been down a little bit, we've been down. Uh, well, you, UCLA and Arizona haven't been handling their 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 right. business lately. So, well, I you know the the way that the the outsider I'm like so I'm originally from Ohio. The way that I see the growth of the Pac-12 from the Pac-8 was okay. We brought in as pairs Arizona, Arizona State, Oregon, Oregon State. And you've got Washington, Washington State. So you have Utah. I don't know if Utah State is the match to that, yeah. but if you have Colorado, Colorado State has facilities. And that's something going to work. Or if you go, hey, we're going to go Vegas, Reno, because mm-hmm. it's all about the travel and how to do that, even though Vegas and Reno aren't next door. But the idea of doing it that way. And San Diego State, let me tell you that it, when, when the, during the Steve Fisher years, and then also what they're doing on the football field, I think that they were, if not at least middle of the pack, maybe better than that of the Pac 12. So it's, there's a way to go. And now that they're the only game in town, when you see that football stadium come into fruition and now they're only game in town, you know, that's going to take off because it's, it's more of a laid back kind of atmosphere anyway. So the, the hype and the hammer of being the NFL maybe didn't fit, but I think they like the college town there and what they do with that. So I think that'll work out pretty well, but I think that it'll work in a pair situation because you're going to go from 12 to 14. Probably. Yeah, absolutely. And, absolutely. and again, Boise, I think is fantastic. But like you said, that may be only basketball. If you really wanted to get crazy about it, you'd say, okay, let somebody talk to John Stockton, pump a bunch of money into Gonzaga and say, you already got the basketball school. What can you do with everything else? You know, yeah. that would that's completely out of the blue, but that's a possibility just because that's the best basketball program on the West Coast, maybe in the country, probably yes. in the country. So, yeah. you know, but again, we know football is the one that brings in the money. So you've got to look, and as you said, you want to continue to be all California or mostly California, or do you want to kind of go a little bit further west? So I think I think Colorado State is is not a sexy pick, but I think that's something that matches up. Um, and again, you've got Vegas, UNLV, and 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 those. So or I'm sorry, Vegas and uh, Reno. So I think that might work as well. But it's an interesting look because. I don't even know who's in that conference anymore. The Mountain West, WAC, what? I don't even know what conference it is anymore. You know, I'm doing some of my stuff and I'm like, I don't have them in the right folder now. I, you know, how did Chicago State get in this conference? What in the world am I looking at? So, you know, it's it's completely out of the blue. So I don't know. All right. So now, as I made my segue 10 minutes ago, I'll continue the segue. When we can, we look at the NFL, and, and the week that was and the week that's going to be and all that. But let's touch on something else real quick. Just give me a, an idea of, because it's really prevalent in the Pac-12, and we're starting to see it be a problem. Actually, we've seen it be a problem in other places as well. The, the, the COVID, I don't want to call it, let's just, let's just put it out there. The problems we've had with games because of COVID, which we understand if, if you believe that COVID is a thing, which I do, I understand why we've had problems. But as you said, you you miss move things around for UCL or USC to be in the in the title game, but we're seeing things in all of football right now in all of sports. Um, what's your take? And we'll go back to college real quick. What's your take on Ohio State being able to play in a game that they're not they didn't qualify for, and other schools being kept out of those games because their conference didn't allow them to play. All right, man, thank you for bringing this up because this is something that I've been arguing about in my personal chats, my sports chats on, and via text. Um, 
my military buddies, Sports Talk 2.0 uh, Facebook pages. This is a hot topic right now. But also, here's my hot take. I think the Big Ten can do whatever the heck they want. Like, you know what I mean? Also, like, let's be honest with ourselves right now. Is Ohio State one of the best football programs in the United States? Absolutely. So you can't – don't pigeonhole yourself and say – look, they, what they do is they put some parameters down. Here's what we want to see, six games, right? But, like, also they didn't say this is the restriction and that's right. end all be all. And also, guess who has the power – to change things, you know, the, the conference. They levied these restrictions on themselves. They can undo it. It's not like the NCAA came and put that six game thing on them. So like, I don't have a problem with it. I really don't. And also I love the little guy. I want the underdog to get in there. I want the Cincinnati's and I want the little guy to get in there, but we're not talking about the best football teams. If you don't talk about Ohio state being in there, there's also still one game. still another game, right? right? So they still got to win, you know, right. they, they could not show up and lose that game and there's nothing to talk about anymore. So I don't have a problem with it. And yes, COVID, everybody needs to be extremely flexible with all this stuff. I know it's not the, the, the regular season that we're all looking for, but at least it's here. And at least we did get to watch some football because could you imagine this fall and winter without it? I can't. So um, I don't have a problem with it. And uh, I would, you know, is it? It's Northwestern, right? Are they playing Northwestern. Correct, correct. correct. I think it, I think it's going to be a good game. I think it'll be a decent game. Uh, it, you know, back to the talent gap. Uh, eventually, in the fourth quarter, I think that's going to take off and probably, probably distance in between them, maybe a two-score game or so. But uh, I don't think it's going to be horrible. Uh, that game versus Indiana was amazing. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that it was a competitive game, uh, especially for Indiana's sake. You know, oh, you know, yeah, definitely. The get, getting on the map. I love that. Uh, but yeah, you know, like I said, I don't have a problem with it. And uh, I want to see the best football in the CFP, right? That's what it was designed to do. Not most popular contest like BCS was. Uh, CFP is still the best football teams with the said schedule. There's all, we can only go 2020 schedule. There's nothing else. We can't, we can't do anything else, right? Who did you play? Who did you beat? Best four teams, let's go. And uh, I don't think you can have a conversation without Ohio State in it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I recuse myself from most of these things since I'm, I'm not wearing the Ohio State shirt today. I'm a yeah. Ohio State guy. So uh, <laughs> I, I try to keep it Vegas neutral today. But it, it's the yeah. idea of, you know, if it would, were to happen to say Clemson, Alabama, whomever, you'd like to think they would have done the same thing. And you'd like to think that I've been complaining about it. So that's the way it works. I understand that completely. You know, I was like, well, you let Alabama in. Well, you know, it, it, the, 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 the idea is this was a season where we had to adapt to all kinds of things. And if you're not ready for adaptation, you're in trouble to begin with. And we adapted and we adapted again. You know, I'm the one that went on record in, and has still been on record of they should have never played the season in the first place. Once you canceled it, it's canceled. Yeah. And then the reason, in my opinion, that you started to play was because you came to people that said you shouldn't cancel it. And especially if you look at the Pac-12, who said, well, we're just going to do what they did. And okay, well, they decided to play. And then the Mac said, well, we're going to do what they did. Okay, well, were you really sure you're going to get games in? And the problem that I had in my head was I was too static. And I didn't realize they've had contingencies upon contingencies upon contingencies that, hey, we just want to play. If we can play, great. If it gets screwed up, it gets screwed up. But we're prepared to just let it flow because they've never shown that adaptability before. So I give them credit for that, for everybody. Whether you get to play the game or don't get to play the game, whether you get to have guys play that should play, whatever, they've made it work. Better than I ever dreamed they would have. So the people that are complaining about how this is set up, they haven't seen the way everything else has worked. So I'm impressed that they, they, they got it to do something and you know we did have college football which if you've been inside for the last nine months which i have been you know i needed something so that's yeah. that, i'm pretty impressed with that so sure. now the original segue was to go to um the COVID problems in the nfl and how that's affected some teams and we saw a bounce back of that last night of hey 
we've got most of our roster back today, which we didn't have a couple of weeks ago, like the, uh, the, the Broncos that didn't have a quarterback on the roster, you know, and the Ravens like, we can finally play with everybody. And they did. What, what did you think of that game last night? The, the Browns and the Ravens. Yeah, I thought it was a great game. Uh, and just to see Lamar out there doing his thing again, like he is just so explosive when he is Scary. out, when he's out in the open field, man, it's just, I, it, it's a joy to watch. Like he just blows right by people. But I'll say this though. Like I, the Ravens have had a lot of missteps this year, right? Like it, it's COVID driven. Okay, sure. But I also think the AFC is hand over fist better than it was in the last few years. Cause it was like Patriots and everybody else. And then now chiefs and everybody else, but it's not just chiefs and everybody else this year. Right. Uh, and then the Ravens, you know, Ravens are extremely strong the last, you know, that last year and then Lamar's MVP year, but like, let's talk about the bills. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's talk about the Browns. Uh, and then Pittsburgh is like, you know, they never have these really bad seasons where they, you know, when they're, they're a top pick in the draft uh, in the draft. So they're always around nine and seven and 10 and six, but like, you know, they're having a great year. Of course, you know, there's all kinds of things you can talk about with them. But the AF the Miami's resurgence with Tua, yep. I mean, like the AFC is stacked. And we haven't even said the I haven't even mentioned the Colts and I haven't mentioned the Titans. Uh um, your hometown team here. And then the Ravens, the Ravens, uh Raiders, sorry, I think they uh I think that ship just sailed the other day though. Like But I've thought that three times this year. Yeah, I I don't know, man. I, I think uh the firing of the DC, I think that's not not writing on the wall, and they're not out. But yesterday's yesterday's Ravens win really messed up a lot of things for the teams that are on the on yeah. the on the cut right. because right. that that just said every that just gave them another game that you were trying to gain. So uh, I think that hurt Miami significantly, and I think it pretty much. Second to last nail in the coffin for the Raiders last night yeah. was that that Ravens win because had the Browns won, like the the Ravens would have shifted down and everybody else would have shifted up. Uh, but uh, there's a couple teams out there with a tough rest of their schedule. Uh, Pittsburgh has a tough schedule. Um, Bills still got to play Miami one more time, I believe. Right. right. Yeah, Miami's got a real tough schedule the rest of the way, and the Ravens have three basically automatic wins. Uh, uh, they got the they got the Bengals once. And then they're 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 going good. So that win against the Browns yesterday was massive, uh, on a standing scale, on a confidence scale, uh, on a national scale. Everybody considering it the best game of the year last year. Oh yeah. So now, the everybody jumped off the bandwagon of the Ra- uh, Ravens a couple weeks ago. Everybody's back on. Jumping back on, right? So, uh, the AFC is going to be really nice one through seven in the playoffs this year. Those going to be tough, tough games. Well, see, the, the problem that I have with the Chiefs, and it's not much of a problem because that team is just it, – it has what you need. But it's almost – and I don't, I don't know that they know that they're doing this, but you know when you play with that, that guy that's just got that something and he's not really connected to the game, and then when it comes down to game time, he says, oh, give me the ball, I got you. Yeah. That's what the Chiefs give me. You know, yeah. we're going to take some shots. We're going to do what we have to do. But we know when it comes down to it, we're going to win the game. We're going to get, you know, Chris Jones is going to get a strip sack. Uh, we, we've got Hardman. We've got Sammy Watkins. we got the, I can hit anybody I want whenever I want to, you know, if, if I'm a Holmes and we're going to score. And if we need to, you know, Kelsey's leading – the tight ends leading the league in receiving yards? What in the heck? Yeah. I mean – it, there, there's so many things about that team just don't make any sense, but they don't have to play great to play well. And that's, that's really scary. So I want to see the team that's going to come up and hit them at the right time. Like the Raiders did that says, you know, we're not going to let you turn it on at the end. We're going to figure out what it is twice. Right. Twice. So, you know, that, that's the tough thing, it, which, which makes it hard to throw dirt on the Raiders. Yeah. Because, and again, that's that roller coaster. Yeah, and I, and I and I wouldn't have I wouldn't have if if just all the other teams were were not surging. Right. Like, like I said, right. man. Like Miami is playing fantastic. Uh, you know, the, like the Ravens are back on a straight course. Uh, Pittsburgh keeps losing games, but they're not going anywhere. They already have double digit right. wins. 
Uh, and then the Bills are running away with that uh, that division. And also, like, they look very tough, very, very tough. As long as as long as long the Allen and Stephon Diggs connection keeps happening, uh, those guys are going to be tough to beat. And I've been saying that for a long time. I've been saying that uh, on another podcast. I was raving about the Bills. I, I said that the Bills were the best team in the AFC, actually. I went all the way into Hot Take Lake. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I also just – I mean, imagine if they didn't lose that Hail Mary game to the Cardinals. Like, right, they would right. be uh, – you know, they'd be 11-2 and two right now. So – uh, bills are nasty and like i said one through seven afc is really good if you can crack into that uh seven uh into the seven seed uh to play that two seed that's going to be an even matchup it's going to be and, an even matchup and the thing about this season we've seen now i think the browns may have had a little home cooking last night they did have some fans there and they did have a different setup as far as weather and field conditions and whatnot but what we're going to see is you're well, like the 49ers, they're not gonna play in their own state. Yeah. So we're we're looking at I don't think in this particular season that you know one versus eight, two versus six, however it plays out, is gonna mean as much because A, they're closer than they normally are, and B, I don't think home field means quite as much as it used to. So Absolutely you can right. get the quote unquote underdog into a game and they might feel that they're gonna come out and kick some butt. Now, when we flip it to the other side, to the NFC, is there a clear cut, this is going to be what it's going to be? Is it still kind of, are you sold on the Packers or? Uh, well, I mean, the Saints, so cave, uh, caveat, that's kind of the NFL team that I track because my wife is from New Orleans. Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously they're a lot of fun to watch and the, the game, the atmosphere down there, every time I go with her back home, like, we always catch a game and it's just, yeah. in, it's insane. insane yeah. As a sports fan, like that's, that's, that's where you want to be. But anyway, the Saints like best defense in the league. Uh, and at least the NFC side, uh, they do everything well, but not, not last week, not Sunday. Uh, so I think they're still the best team in the NFC though. I think the Saints are the best team in the NFC, but uh, the Packers, they're there every year, right? They are there every year. And Devontae, the, the, as long as Devontae oh, Adams is healthy, like the reason why they haven't been as relevant as they should be uh, in the playoffs is that they always are missing an injured Devontae right, Adams. Right, right. Or they're missing an offensive lineman and Aaron Jones can't break free uh, or they're missing somebody and then Rodgers can't stay up and throw the ball around. So like there's always one thing going on with the Packers, man. They check all the blocks every year and then one thing happens the last couple games of the year they right. play it they play a tough game a lineman goes down a wide receiver goes down a, a key linebacker or defensive lineman goes down and it's like boom they lose in the first round of the playoffs well, but they're I looking good right now though what happens to them and it's it's easy to say in in that division that well the bears are down the lions are down the vikings are down, blah, down. Blah, blah, blah 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 they're always but, down. they're always down but <laughs> it's still a tough game you come out of those division rivalry games and all the division games or rivalry games when talking Packers, Bears, uh, Vikings, and, and, and uh, I just said the Lions. They're always tough games. So you never come out of those healthy. So for the Packers, they get to the end of the season with a good record because they beat up on some teams twice in their division. Yeah. But they also get beat up physically themselves, like you say. When's the last time we saw? I'm not even sure we saw Devontae Adams play in the playoffs in the last three years. Yeah, for sure. So, black, black and blue division, right? Exactly, right. Yeah. So that's always a tough thing for them. Now, as you mentioned, the the, the you know Drew Brees, and I don't know if you have, if I bring Drew Brees, Drew, yeah, Drew Brees back until the playoffs. If you can make the playoffs, and again without worrying about what home field is, and if you feel that that helps, because he can't possibly be healthy this week or next week. Or, I mean, it cracked ribs, really. Right, and not one or two, like 12. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and I have a bad problem, like, and I have a stomach ache, you know, so. Sounds like he was in a car crash. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what it sounds like. And so, how, you know, how do you get him healthy enough to play quarterback in the NFL? It, with, it, it's not like it's a hamstring pull that you can, you know, go get therapy on. and But it, it's a cracked rib zuck. So. You know, if, if you can get, excuse me, into the playoffs, especially this season, I just coast into the playoffs, play as well as you can, 
and then bring him in. I, I'm shocked that it's not a – we haven't seen some Jameis Winston a little bit more, but that's what they want to do. That's what they want to do. That's fine. You know, yeah. it's the – it's the other side when we go to the NFC East or least or East or whatever it's supposed to be called. Um, what, what is your take on any of that? Or is there a take to have on that division? Man, I, so about three weeks ago, I was like, man, what if the Giants had Saquon Barkley? Ooh, okay. And uh, I was like, dude, they would be running away with this division. But then, so they've been playing well. They've been getting a lot better. A nice win at Seattle the other day. Mm -hmm, But I think who we're not talking about is that Washington football team, WFT. Uh, I think hands down they're going to win that division uh, because, like, I think overall, and I I said this on uh, on the Nuts and Bolts podcast the other night, uh, I think their roster overall, right, with Alex Smith, with that running game of Gibson, he has been a monster this year. He was like a third, second or third round pick. And he just took that starting job and has been running with it. Uh, they probably lack a big number one and a number two uh, because McLaurin's kind of a slot guy uh, from Ohio State. Your boy. He's good. Yeah. Yeah, he's nice, but I, he's not number one and he's not very big. So he's more slotty. Uh, but uh, their defense is nasty. Like Chase Young has turned it up a notch lately. And I think. A lot. I think these teams in the East, like they took their bumps and their bruises in the first part of the year, but you know, there's no preseason. So everybody's getting warmed up, warmed up coaching, you know, philosophies are changing week in and week out. And I think the giants and the, and the football team have been like, dude, we can win this. Right. We can, we, we can make the playoffs, whether we lose or not, we can get in there and at least just like have a seat at the table and see what happens. And the, the, you know, the, the, the emergence of Alex Smith, what an incredible story. Uh, but he's a good quarterback. Like, I'm right. not really understanding how I know he was the injury, but, like, uh, he probably should have been in there at the beginning of the year. Like, Haskins, I don't know what they saw. And I have faith in Ron Rivera. I think he's a really good coach. What he did in Carolina all those years with a very limited roster was phenomenal. And he's doing the same thing here in Washington. So, uh, I think with a big play receiver and maybe a little bit more addition to that already nasty defense, like they're really going to emerge maybe in the future in the next year. But like this year, uh, they're in the driver's seat right now, six and seven. Uh, but someone's got to win that division, unfortunately. Uh, but I would not sleep on the Washington football team at all. Like they are showing that they are not playing around right now and they're playing good football. Gibson has missed two weeks. Uh, once he gets back, now they'll have a nasty running game. Right. He just, I think he just turned an ankle. He'll be fine. Yeah, He'll be back yeah. a little bit. Uh, but yeah, Gibson, they, they, they do everything that you, you know, like the, the outline of good football. Uh, block, run the ball, play good defense. Don't turn the ball over. That's Alex Smith to a T. Do not turn the ball over. So. And Ron Rivera, right. Yeah, Well, I, I think the thing that you mentioned earlier, uh, I can go back and the, but you mentioned earlier was the idea of, hope when you have hope or you or there is a lack of hope that affects how you play now as a non-professional athlete I always say how can you not be confident because you're still a professional athlete how can you not play with confidence if that's what got you there in the first place but I understand even though it doesn't make sense to me it makes sense because I see it and I look at that team And they have a confidence about them that they didn't have at the beginning of the season. And the hope is there is hope we can win the division and make the playoffs. And in this weird year, if we make the playoffs, something can happen. And there is that hope. I think the giants kind of have that hope. I think the Cowboys and the Eagles have just punted it completely. So yeah, it's a, it's a weird way. And the rest of the NFC kind of works out the same way. You've got your Cardinals that are, you know, what, what happens when Larry Fitzgerald comes back? Okay. He's back. What does it make a difference? Should it make a difference? You know? And again, it's that, how do we smooth out the the hills and valleys? How do we do that? Because if they can do that, they can play with anybody. Unfortunately, they haven't been able to do that. And that's the thing you're like, okay, how do you make it? So we don't have, and and I've seen kind of the game plan on Kyler. We're we're not going to rush him. 
too hard. We're going to make sure we keep big guys in the middle, and he's got no room to, to escape from that way. He's going to have to throw over large people down the middle, and we're not going to let him escape outside. Easier said than done, but that's it. Uh, but that's when you have to have a running game step up. That's when you have to have a, a, a tough inside receiver like a Larry Fitzgerald. That's when those things are going to have to happen. But, you know, other than that, you know, having a game plan for a guy that's hard to game plan for doesn't mean it's going to work. So if they can get their smooth things out, I think they're in the mix as well, or should be in the mix. Yeah, I mean, and just back to watch it real quick, like, you know, they're going to win the division and they're going to end up the fourth seed, right? Right. Uh, but they're going to they're going to get a favorable because uh, they're going to get a wild card game. Right. So, like, it's not going to be – they're not going to go right into battling the top team in the NFC. They're going to get uh, someone who limped in, uh, you know what I mean, like maybe a Cardinals right. uh, or, or uh, Tampa Bay. Right. Mm-hmm. They're going to get one of those teams that they could definitely play with right. and, and take out. So uh, a, a special part of me, I was rooting for the Cardinals, man. Like they haven't been very good in a long time. Uh, that Super Bowl run and that loss to Pittsburgh was very disheartening uh, all those years back, probably about a decade now. Right. Uh, but uh, so they haven't been very good in a long time. I love the Kyler Murray story. Uh, actually loving the Cliff Kingsbury uh, plucking, <laughs> plucking him out of, a, a, an average college football team and how, having, I, I don't know how it worked, but it's working. So how much did we slap him around to start right? the season? Absolutely. Oh, uh, what in the heck are you doing hiring this guy? He yeah. doesn't know what he's doing. He came from a losing football program. He wasn't, you know, it, it, his college success as a quarterback didn't carry over to the pros, blah, 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 blah. His system were, and they were ready. Everyone was just ready to tar and feather him. Look where they're at now. Yeah, Cardinals are looking good. Uh, another team with a lot of good balance, right? A lot of good balance. Uh, you can can run the ball tremendously, uh, but can throw to uh, the the pickup of Hopkins is just literally the transaction of, of the century. Um, like the the Bears would hold that rec, uh, hold that recognition uh, if they were a little bit better with that Khalil Mack trade. But right. uh, I think take the Cardinals getting uh, D Hop is 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 just tremendous. So, but they're going to probably limp in looking at seven and six. The, the Rams and the Seahawks are, are kind of uh, still two games ahead in that division. Uh, the Rams or the Seahawks are going to win that. But yeah, Car- uh, Cardinals are going to, they're going to get in there and uh, hopefully they make some noise, but, but we'll see. But yeah, kudos Cliff Kingsbury, man, doing great. Well, it's one of those situations where you look at your GM and go, got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cause we were. You. I yeah, told you. I, I knew what I was talking about. That's <laughs> why it's you. my job, not your yeah. job. Exactly. Right. And, and that's the fun of this. And the fun of being able to do this is, okay, we second guess a lot. Yeah. Sometimes we even first guess. But we know what we know. And hopefully, especially as a fan, you hope that the guy in charge knows what he knows. So, and as you mentioned once, like, I, I'm watching this and going, I can see how to defend this. Why can't they see how to defend this? Well, when when you get to that, that's scary. Yeah. But when you see the drafting or the, the signing of Kingsbury, the drafting of Kyler Murray, which again was one of those, you did you really get the guy you wanted? Oh, well, I don't know about that. And then you go, well, I'll show you. I really know how to do this. I'm going to go out and get uh, Hopkins. That right there went, okay, maybe he's smarter than I thought. Because you, how did you get that, make that move, and how did he not end up with another twenty teams? If he was available, how did you get him for David Johnson? Yeah, and then uh, you know, the uh, first round pick on Buda Baker that wasn't right. supposed to, that wasn't supposed to work out either. Look at that right. boy playing out right. there. Exactly. I'm glad that he left uh, Washington. Tired of seeing him blowing up my wide receivers. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, he's, he's doing great too. It's, it's a nice season so far. Now, how do we see it ending up? Because we looked at the college football playoffs and go, okay, we pretty much know what the four teams are going to be, regardless of, unless, again, a whole bunch of stuff happens. But let me, let me go back a second for that. Um, having a military discipline background, answer this question for me. Yeah. I asked this question to everybody in the last day or so. 
will the guy that threw the shoe in Florida, if you were his coach, would he ever see the field again? Or is he like the Florida's next generation of Steve Bartman? I mean, how in the world? And he was like, and flexing after like, and like that to me is one of those generational gaffes that you go, did I just see that happen? And all the flags came out. It was great because all the flags came out in unison. It's like a synchronized flag throw and like, uh oh, and one play, one play we could be talking about. SC champion, SEC championship, they still get a chance to play in the game. Yeah. But even if they win the game, they're not they're not yeah. going to the to the dance. Yeah. So they could have been in the playoffs. They could have been there, possibility to win a national championship. One stupid mistake. And and I, I had to bring that up before we close out because I just I wanted your take on that because it's like I can't imagine anyone that I've ever played with would have went, this is a good idea. Yeah. So my take on it, man, is like, so it's so hard for me to watch. Uh, I, 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 let me rewind a little bit. So like you want players that play with fire like that, right? right, right. Uh, and the new age of coaching style is let them be themselves, so to speak. Let them express themselves. But it's not pro, pro ball, pro sports. Like you can express yourselves in pro ball, pro sports because you're getting paid to do such a thing. You're getting paid to put people in the stands. Like college right. football players are not being paid to fill the stands, right? So I like the fire and I like the passion, but there's always a place for all of that, right? And there's a time where you just got to know uh, that you can't express yourself with the helmet taking off, the, the gronk spike in college, obviously you can't do that. And then something like this with the shoe, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I know that kid feels horrible right now, so I don't want to kick him, kick a brother when he's down. down. Right. Uh, but uh, did you also see Dan Mullen's quote? That'll yeah, tell see, you, that's, that's that'll what tell you right, right there what's going Where on. Where came from, I mean, right. That's you know, what scared me, right. Everybody else would have been like, hey, we don't condone that type of action. Uh, it was a one-time thing. I know that kid well. I recruited him. I've been developing him. You know, he's uh, he's – you know, this, this year's old, he's a man. No one feels um, worse than he does. Blah, 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 yeah, blah. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I, I just, uh, I, I'm not going to blame the coaching. I think it was just a caught up in a moment type thing. Uh, I, but like, that's part of, that's part of athletic development mentally. Sure. It's sure. just knowing when and where to do those types of things, when to pimp the Homer, uh, when to uh, run to the sideline and take your helmet off and, and, and hype up your boys. You know what I mean? Uh, and then to an LSU team that is just like just decimated uh, from the NFL draft. And then like, you know, maybe Coach Ogeron might be on the chopping block. Like you could have sealed all of that fate. Uh, I'll tell you what, though, I will kind of take a jab at that, that you saying that they were going to make the CFP. I still don't think they would have got in there. I just yeah, don't. No, I understand. Yeah, I think, but I, it's I think eliminated our, the possibility. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh yeah, there's just a lot of work for them to do. Um, that loss to Alabama, and then there just really isn't any good other really good wins that say, "Oh, take me." Right. Uh, I think our our top four has been uh, even even with Clemson losing the Notre Dame. Like, I don't, no one saw Clemson coming all the way out of the four. Right. Uh, so I think that's been solid. Uh, unless someone takes a misstep, it's going to be there for it's going to be their spot to lose. Um, and then Texas A&M just hanging out, but they got blown out by Alabama. So, right. uh, but yeah, yeah, that poor kid, man. Like in like, uh, and then that happened last year too. Uh, well, the, the guy did the fire hydrant, uh, right. Oh right? yeah. Oh geez. And yeah. The, yeah. That, that lost the game. Like, Oh yeah. Florida, right. Florida was the, the, that penalty gave them, uh, the, that penalty gave LSU a chance to win, but like the penalty last year, like that was to like lose the game. That was a touchdown. That was a call right. back. Right, right. Uh, so that's even whew, that's worse. And uh, and I and I was watching the one last year. I was watching it live, and you know once you get in the end zone, you're not really like okay. Here comes the commercial. <laughs> yeah, and you're just like oh oh my god, what did he do? Did he? Oh no, yeah. So. You know, and it's it's the same as the guys that you know are 
break away. There's no one within 20 yards, and they drop the ball before they get to the goal line. And you're like, what, what was the point? And I've never understood the point of that. You know, at least get three yards deep in the end zone. You carried the ball that long. It's, did, did it get heavy? You know, so I don't know. There's just certain things you look at and go, wow, did I just see what I just saw? Ooh, I think I did. You know, so it's it's an amazing thing that this season has just been so – for everything has been so up and down and I'm glad we have something. I'm glad you're taking the time to talk to us. I really do. Uh, that's been, it's been fantastic. I hope we can do it again sometime. Um, yeah, Absolutely. yeah give, man, I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I tell you what, give the people an idea of where they can find you, what, what's going on, how, how your, you know, Twitter handles, all that good fun stuff. And we'll close it from there. All right. I don't have a Twitter handle just yet. I'm working on it. Right. I know I need to get on that game, but I just haven't done it yet. Uh, that's, that's on me, but uh, LinkedIn for now, uh, just type in Joseph Kuroga with a Q-U-I-R-O-G-A uh, and hit me up for a connect and we can talk sports on there. Uh, you can see my sports content and also some of the podcasts that I do go on. Uh, I, I, I post them on LinkedIn uh, so people can see me in action talking about sports, my passion. This is what I do. Cool. All right. Well, thank you once again. Uh, it's been a great time. And uh, everybody else, we will see you tomorrow when we go to Real Boxing Talk and a whole bunch of other stuff. So thank you, sir. Appreciate the time. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank.